Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 3rd, 2015, and this is the Week in Charts. Well, we got a lot to cover this week, but I'm still out of Mountain Dew. I need to get around to going to the store or putting it on the grocery list. I keep forgetting, but um, we'll fix that soon. I think I'll be okay, though. We do have a lot to cover. Uh, this is Clay Screed. Let me just give you the short version on that. All predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, what are we talk about? Well, Ron Grice did some interesting research, and he published it in the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts uh, Forum. And uh, it kind of inspired me to take that one step further. It, it, it'd be quicker just to get to, to, to talk about it. And the main thing is, the, uh, the market is the show. So I went back 100 years or so and looked at the, the death cross, which um, everybody gets all excited about. And I think it's just a silly name that gets everybody all um, excited. But this is uh, one of the pages that Ron Grice published. Uh, his website is thechartstore.com. He does a lot of very interesting research and uh, probably a lot of things that I would do if I had the time uh, just to uh, – but uh, there's just so many so many hours in a day. So I'm glad there's people like Ron out there that are actually doing this type of research. And I think it's important to look at calendar periods when it comes to markets because it is very useful information. But I also think it's important to look at what happens in between. So this guy be thinking, let me just see what happens in between. So just to kind of show you what I'm talking about. And the research took me, I thought I'd bang it out pretty quickly. It took me a little longer than I thought, and that's why, again, I admire people like Ron that, that put the time in uh, in the research. Not that, I, not that I'm hoping to imply that he's not busy. He's busy with research, and, and um, I just wish I had more time to even do more research. Uh, but the point, instead of just saying, okay, well, we have a signal. Let's look out uh, one month, two months, three months, and whatever – which I think is vitally important to look out in the future, see what's happened. But I thought it would also be kind of interesting to see what happens in between. So what would be the low of the move after the signal? And then what would be the high before it crosses back over? Okay, so it crosses back over here. So here would be the high when it crosses, excuse me, when it crosses back over. I think some other interesting research would be uh, intermediate term highs in between because sometimes it'll cross over and then it'll go back up like this and it'll come back in. So the spreadsheet that I'm getting ready to show you, in fact, let me just jump right into that, doesn't have the money management in between. And it looks like, uh, is it too big? No, okay. So if you go back to 2011, and this, this number kind of surprised me here. That's one of the things that's kind of fun to go back when you're doing the research. And even though in 2011, the, the the market just sort of looked like it um, it triggered the signal and nothing really happened, well, it still dropped 9% from that death cross, okay, which is the, by the way, that's the 50 cross of the 200-day moving average. Let me just go back and show you for those of you who weren't familiar with that. And you can see this is your shorter-term moving average, your 50-day moving average here. And this is your 200. And the big deal that everybody gets excited about is when that 50 crosses that 200. Okay. So, but it is kind of interesting. 2011, there was a 9% move. And then you can see by the time it got all crossed back over, it did go back up 13% from this number here. Okay. So, again, there's no money management or position management involved. But I think this is kind of interesting that it did go down 9% in between. Now, 2010, it just kind of had a blip down. And by the time it crossed over, everything was over. Keep in mind, usually, not always, but usually, well, okay, first of all, let me just say two things. One thing is a fact. There's always a lag in indicators because indicators are derivative of price, whether it's a moving average, an oscillator, whatever you want to use. As you know, I rarely use any indicators except for the occasional moving average. And in a case like now, it's like I dust off those moving averages, especially the bow tie moving averages, because they're more and more important. Whereas in, if we're just in a good solid trend, 
I'm not really worried about those moving averages so much or anything. Now, the moving averages, they're not indicators, and, and any indicator isn't an indicator for that matter. But what an indicator does, as I often preach, it illustrates what's in the chart. So sometimes you might have a gradual rollover in a market, and to you or to me or whoever, the untrained eye, or, or if you just kind of a casual glance, I should say, you sh you would see that, okay, this market's just kind of going sideways, but it's still in this longer-term uptrend here. But when you put those moving averages in, you might see that it's crossed over, and then you might say, oh, wait a minute, this thing is actually beginning to roll over in here. So uh, just using these two moving averages, you can see the moving the market's just kind of meandering back and forth. And you might, in this particular case, you might say, well, it's just all rage-bound and moving back and forth. It's no big deal. But – if you pay attention to these moving averages cross, it might alert you to the fact that something bigger could be in the works. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to get to the, the bow ties. And, and, well, believe me, you're going to be sick of bow ties by the end of this presentation. So, in 2010, it just kind of barely crossed over. And I think what happened then, in fact, let me just see if I could pull it up quickly on this second chart in here. But if memory serves, it was just like a brief blip lower. By the time the market, by the time everything got all crossed over, the sell-off was was already done. Now, this is something I'm going to talk about quite a bit in a minute, but let me just bring it up now. Don't ever sit around and wait for a moving average to cross over, okay? Like I just said, if it, if it illustrates something that's happening in the chart, then by all means, pay attention, okay? But don't say, oh, well, I'm not going to take this until I get the moving average crossover, unless that's your system in and of itself, okay? Always pay attention to price first. For instance, back here in 2010, if memory serves, I think we got stopped out quite a bit. We had a nice little first thrust here, okay, deep retracement, and we had a pretty nice sell-off from that. Let me just measure that real quick. I don't want to digress too far. So go with your price pattern first, and that was almost a 12% move out of that first thrust. So that's a pretty serious move. But notice that by the time the 50-day moving average got around to crossing the 200, okay, cross right in here, well, it just – that was actually the low of the move by the time it crossed. So it was already done. The bomb had already exploded. It's already done, okay? So let's get back to the – the deal here. So you can see it was already, it only went slightly lower. I think the next day after it um, crossed over, it was down by about four points on the low. Okay, the low of the move, round numbers. And then subsequently, subsequently, is that a word? It subsequently went up about 60% afterwards. Now, in 2007, obviously, that was a pretty big deal. And that was the chart that I just showed. So you could see that you did have the signal. And when a market kind of meanders around like this, and everybody remembers 2003, 2002, 2003, it kind of did this. And then we got the bow tie up very early in that turn and trend. Now, in 2009, as you can see right here, we had more of a spike bottom. And it took a little while for those bow tie moving averages to cross up, cross over. And even if you look at this, 50 and 200 right here, when you have, again, a longer-term bottom like this, I'm sorry, when you have a spike bottom like this, and it's a real move underway, sometimes these crossings could still cross fairly early. Now, you gave up quite a bit of a trade from here to here by waiting for that signal, but the market still doubled from there. And on a weekly basis, we had a weekly bow tie down here around 900 or so. Anyway, so let's get back to the, the the death cross. So you can see the one in 2007 was pretty serious. Market loss, 55% as measured from the crossing day down to the lows. And then even after it crossed back over, it was still down 36%. Now, 2000 was another big deal because it lost nearly half of its value, too. It lost 45%. And even back above the crossing was – Still down 32%. Now, I wouldn't rush out and try to trade all this, but it is kind of interesting. If you're just looking at the 
what happens on a calendar basis, okay, you can see there's quite a bit of green in here. And the moves, and then on the red moves, the red doesn't look that bad, okay? So this kind of, kind of mask what's really going on in between. But when you look at it on a on high to low basis or a signal to low basis and then subsequent highs, it's a whole different story. So if you go back way back in time, I had to use the Dow because I don't have the I only had the S and P to about nineteen sixty five or sixty four or so. So it's kind of fascinating when you go way back in time, you could see that there are some significant numbers in here and then there's, there's some times where not a whole lot really happens in between I, anything less than 10 percent is not a huge deal okay but obviously when you go back into the 20s there was an 80 percent loss even though the, the market crashed okay you would think that okay well it's done but the market still continued to deteriorate over a long long time and even by the time it crossed back over it was up 60 percent now, so what do you do with all this? Well, anytime you get a signal, you need to pay attention to it. And again, you need to pay attention to price first and foremost. If you were long this market, let's say back in 2006, 2007, you should be getting stopped out somewhere in here, or you should have probably been stopped out way back here. And you probably were selective in between because you're like, well, wait a minute, this is just a wide and loose base. It doesn't mean you should rush out and sell the form or make any drastic decisions, but it does mean you should pay attention to what's going on with price. Now, keep in mind when it comes to price, when we get to the actual charts, I want to reiterate this point yet again. Everything works better with trend. So once you establish the fact that you are in a trend, just stick with that trend. And notice the slope of this 50-day moving average, just a 50-day simple daily moving average stayed negative for a long, long time. You might have had a little blip up here and there, but it didn't turn decisively positive until way back in early 2009. And we also got a bunch of signals back then. So I probably need to flesh this out a little bit more. This Again, this research took me a little longer than I thought it would. I thought I would just kind of throw it together real quick. But it was kind of fascinating, some of the things that came out of it. So you do have some very significant moves historically. There's 50% moves, 40% moves, 20% moves, and even 80% moves lower after the death cross. Now, if you, again, if you go back in and you look at it on a calendar basis, sometimes it's not so bad because you can say, well, a year later, the market is up uh, this much or that much. And, and even like if you come a whole year over here, it's like, well, it's up 60%, 60%, 15, 16. These numbers look okay. I mean, obviously, there's a negative one here and there. But overall, it's this kind of suggests, well, let's not even worry about it. But it's what happens in between that's that's kind of interesting. Anyway, any, any questions on that? Or, or does everybody uh, see where I'm going with that? Okay. Now, Howard wants to know about the daily bow tie versus the weekly bow tie significance. Okay, there's a huge significance in that. Okay. Now, patterns are fractal before we get into any, because I get this question quite a bit. So let's take a look at like the spiders. Let's just kind of drive that point home about the fractal nation nature, not nation, nature of pattern. So let's take a look at a one hour S&P 500, okay? Now notice we had an hourly bow tie here off of major highs. By the way, when you are trading a transitional patterns, okay? You want to trade them off of major, major, major highs. You don't want to trade every little, like you wouldn't trade this bow tie and this bow tie. I mean, I guess if you were a, a day trader and you're really into it, then yeah, that's fine. But if you're just trying to capture major market moves, you want to trade the, the market moves off of major highs. So you had one here and you had one here. This was maybe an all-time high. Let's just see what it was. Yeah, hold that thought, Phil. I'll get to that. 
So that was 721. We'll check the daily on 721. So at the least, this is a pretty major high or, or just off of all-time highs. You can see you got a bow tie here. So this hourly bow tie turned out to be the ultimate top of the market. It really, for all intents and purposes, the one before it was pretty much the, the nail in the coffin. Keep it in line with all this death talk, okay? And then you can see you had some shorter-term ones in here when we had the, uh, the series breakdown. So let's get to a daily chart. And let's see, when was 721? Okay, so that was just off of all-time highs. So that would be a significant signal when you get it close to those all-time highs. When you have a trend transition, this is something that I wanted to get into. And I'm going to I have a webinar for someone else tomorrow that I'm going to cover this in a little bit more detail. But when you have a trend transition, you kind of have a market looks like this, begins to roll over. Let's try that again. You have a market, let's say it's in a longer term uptrend, and then it begins to roll over. Well, if you're going to play a trend transition, if it's coming off of all time or 10 year or 20 year or just some sort of major high here, then the most amount of people are going to be trapped on the wrong side of the market. And you're also going to have some Johnny come lately that came in right around here, especially like lately when the market has been in this range. And then you're looking for some sort of signal that the market has turned. Go in and watch last week's webinar where I talked about signal setup followed by the entry. Okay. So you get some kind of signal that the trend has turned. Either there's a thrust lower in the overall market or a bow tie or a death cross or some kind of moving averages roll over. And then you look for some sort of setup. And then you wait for that entry. In other words, you don't get in unless the market begins to trigger on an entry. Right now, S&P 500 retracing a little bit. We've got a nice little pivot mark, pivot low in between. So now might be a good time to look to get some shorts off, but only if you take out this low here. Now, technically, this bow tie has triggered. Technically, this first thrust has triggered. But if you were just coming into the market, if you were on vacation and you're just coming in, he's like, okay, well, we got the signal. We got the daily bow tie. We got uh, whatever bow tie, multi-day bow tie. We got the first thrust down. I see the market faked out lower. Well, we're going to get in below this low. So the question is, let's get back to the um, S&P 500 versus the spiders. So the question is daily versus weekly bow ties. Well, again, as we just saw, patterns are fractal. So we looked at an hourly chart. We looked at a daily. We're looking at a daily chart now, and here's your bow tie here. Okay. So sometimes though, when the market gets choppy and sideways like this. You can kind of see the forest for the trees if you start hitting your your two key for a two day chart or a three key for a three day chart and then work your way up to a four day and even a weekly chart. OK, so on a weekly chart, we have these bow ties at a crossing and I guess it was a rolling weekly chart. We had a signal two days ago. But now that the markets came back up, it's no longer an official signal. That's, I'm just seeing this as we speak. I didn't realize that. Uh, the way Telechart does things is, which I prefer, by the way, is this is a rolling chart. So this is Thursday to Thursday right now. Tomorrow, it's going to be a true weekly chart. It's going to be Friday to Friday, okay, on a five-day chart. So we did, as of Tuesday, I think, I did a video on Monday on YouTube which uh, check out if you get a chance. It's only two minutes. And I talked about the fact that we had a signal imminent. And as of yesterday, we had an official signal. But it looks like today, because of the price came up a little bit, and because they're using a rolling bar instead of a calendar bar, that uh, there's no longer a signal. But it's close. You can see these moving averages are very close. So let's just take a look at a four-day. And you can see at a four-day chart, we already have the crossing here. And then we have the pullback from this. So anything below this low, let's just use 1888 as an entry just because it's here in the chart and it's below these lows. So if the market takes out that level, it could be pretty ugly pretty fast. 
Okay. Now keep in mind on short side, people people come in and bottom fish. Shorts rush in to cover their shorts and take the money. And all this stuff could push the market higher. But we have a mountain of overhead resistance to overcome. So the, what's the significance? The question is, what's the significance between a weekly bow tie and a daily bow tie? Well, everything starts at some level. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the hourly charts, but I will occasionally look at them. And you got to be careful when you drill down anything below a daily chart because you, you start getting caught up in a little bit of noise. Just like earlier, I said, okay, well, if the daily chart looks noisy, back it out a little bit to a two-day, three-day, four-day, five-day chart, okay? So a market move, as you just saw, will begin as an hourly bow tie or hourly first throw, so hourly whatever pattern you're following on that hourly chart long before it happens on a daily chart, long before obviously it happens on a weekly chart. But again, that, that, that hourly could get a little noisy, so just be careful if you're looking at that. But the further you go out in time, as far as your time frame, the more significant the signal becomes. And again, I know I kind of beat the dead horse on this, but we had the bow tie in 2000. We had a bow tie up in 2003. And then, of course, we had one down in 2007. And then we had one that was a little late to the game in 2009. But on a daily basis, I remember very vividly we had uh, – this was, I think, in 2008. They were like, oil 200 or whatever. It was stupid. And when you start hearing all that hype and all, you know it's coming to an end, the, that a market is probably in a parabolic move. And then that, right about that time, early 2009, was going to be the end of the world for the energies or, or whatever, and everything began to take off again. So pay attention to these signals, but watch the – Price bars first and foremost. Okay. Howard says week SP shows weekly bow tie today. Let me let me take a look at that. Maybe I was maybe there's the spiders that that I've got confused with. Uh yeah, no, not yet, because the it was like a day ago, but what happens is the price bar came the close came up a little bit. I mean, obviously this is the moving target because this is a live price. So depending on where we close today, it could be a signal. But ideally, for it to be a, a, a by a textbook said, no, you need the crossing first, then you need the pullback. Okay. Now Phil says, I think that I have seed back test on Death Cross, which shows it as a losing system. Well, it's interesting because I thought about that too, and that's where you come in and you look at like, well, what is the system in and of itself? So if you're looking at the system. As just saying, okay, well, when you get the cross, you sell and whatever. Yeah, it, it might be a losing system. But if you put a little money management into it, everything works better with trend and everything works better with money management. Then it and any other trend following methodology for that matter isn't necessarily a losing system. So you could see that you had – moves in your favor now how much was the move in between okay well this was the this would be the move all the way back if you waited all the way until it got back above the 50-day moving average but you can see when you get go way back in time there's a lot of negative numbers in this column so at some point in time your trade was profitable by as much as 80 percent yeah but what happened in between well that's where trend following gets a little tough and that's why i spend so much time talking about money management and position management and taking partial profits and trailing stops and letting things open up in between because yeah you might your equity curve um on a net net basis it might look like wow 80 percent but yeah in between you might have some pretty big uh numbers and that's why you got to be careful with system development because sometimes people will show like oh well look it made uh it made 50 something percent well in between you might have had you might have been down 20 percent or more on a trade okay although in that one it didn't but you kind of get the idea so you got to be really careful and, and i know that there are system developers out there that'll that'll uh tell you about well i mean reversion systems 
and, and how profitable they are, 90% profitable, and you make all this money. Well, what they fail to tell you is on some of those trades, they failed so miserably and drew down so far that in reality, you would have been stupid not to take that loss. They thought, well, don't use stops because they don't doesn't work with stops. Well, a lot of stuff doesn't work with stops. My stuff doesn't work without stops, okay? Wait, let me rephrase that. A lot of trading systems do not work with stops. When I programmed my first trading system, I got all excited, and then I put stops in, and then it actually hurt the performance to my surprise. And that's because sometimes trades go sharply against you, but then turn around and come back up. And that's kind of like the theory with the mean reversion is that the market gets stretched so far in one direction that it bounces back in the other direction. But if you exit it while it's getting more and more stretched, then you can lose money on that trade. But unfortunately, if that market is taking a nosedive and you fail to exit, eventually you're going to get wiped out in doing such, okay? Hopefully that made a lot of sense. But uh, does that make any sense? You can't. You got to watch systems where they don't tell you what happens in between, okay? Just just like if you bought on a calendar basis, if you weren't worried about the, these crosses or whatever on a calendar basis, then take a look at this, these numbers over here. These numbers look pretty good over here. In fact, you could almost run – that's almost like you could run money off of that be kind of fun to see what that comes out to. It's like, okay, well, we're just going to buy the market every time it has a death cross, and let's see how we do. Well, you had a pretty bad year getting started here, but if you started a year later, you pretty had a pretty good track record as a money manager. But it's what happens in between that's important, and that's kind of – I think that's the point I'm trying to make is that it's what happens in between that's important, and you have to trail stops. You have to honor your stops. and you have to take partial profits along the way. Okay. Scott says, perfect said, back testing is more of a disappointing experience as you get schooled in reality. Yeah, and, and that's the thing to realize too is a lot of times you have, you, you're, you're recognizing an aberration in the market, okay? So let's say you, you, let's say you, you came into 2015 and you got all jazzed up about a mean reversion system. And you started trading that in 2015. And you're like, I am absolutely printing money with this thing. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Okay? And you're feeling like God. And then a couple of weeks ago, what happens? The market absolutely implodes. So it's like you, your little observation was based on such a small period of time, you're not seeing what could actually happen in the markets. And we have a saying in the South, the sun doesn't shine on the same dog's ass every day. I'm getting emails after emails from people that are doing spreads and mean reversion and all this stuff, and they're bragging about their systems. And it's like, okay, it, you know, so I always say, email me in two years and let me know how you're doing, okay? I had one guy made it 13 years and then, then he blew up. You know, it's like, so just know what you're doing and make sure it, it, it's it's common sense, first and foremost. And even more importantly, I should say, make sure you have a risk control and in, in plan and that you are positioning yourself to make more money than you could possibly lose and not just the opposite. Okay. In other words, limited losses, unlimited gains versus limited gains and unlimited losses. You could write a very easy, I had a system once, I thought I discovered a bit of a holy grail. It was like the 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 exit strategy was you exit on your first profitable open. And it was like 90 something percent correct. Well, I haven't tracked it in a long, long time. But I would imagine that eventually it probably either blew up or it didn't do so great because you would just take it little bitty profits. If it was a one tick profit or it was a 100 uh, point profit, you would take it that, that profit on the open and probably didn't work out longer term. But, but yeah, over the short term, I really thought I had something really cool. Stocks took a while me took a while for me no longer. Stops took a while for me no longer trade without them. Yeah. 
and and that's that's a that's a lesson to learn. In the market often rewards bad behavior because if you honor your stop, the market turns around and goes right back in the intended direction. And you're like, well, I'm never going to do that again. You know, I'm not going to get faked out. And then what happens? The next trade, you get blown up. Okay. Would it be better to wait to see if the 200 slope gets negative like in early 2008? And that's something else. I need to finish reading. Uh, I need to go back and study Ron's um, research a little bit more because I noticed as I'm kind of uh, putting everything together that he says here the 50-day moving average – moves is falling and moves below the 200 day moving average which is also falling so does that mean it's only a death cross but every cross in history he had here and i didn't really study the 200 day to make sure they're both falling so the question is um oh did i delete the question should we wait for the yes the 200 to fall no you shouldn't wait for anything uh once your price patterns are there then pay attention to that first and foremost. The 200-day moving average just kind of gives you a confirmation and sometimes a little bit of a historical reference. Let me do a wide line in here. Let's see if we can do it. Oh, where'd it go? Average. Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Um, the 200-day moving average does have a negative slope. Doesn't it? Uh, let's see. It's um, 2073, 2074. Yeah, it's got a negative slope. But I wouldn't sit around and wait for a negative slope in the 200-day moving average. Now, speaking of slope, you can see nice little positive slope for most of this nice little move higher. And now we have a negative slope in the 200-day. Um, I'm always talking about how great my bow ties are. But if you just put in a, as I said last week and week before, if you just put in a 50-day moving average, sometimes that in and of itself, we'll change the color on it too, can do a pretty good job keeping you on the right side of the market too. There's nothing magical about it, but you can see there's your bow tie. There's a negative slope in the 50. There's your bow tie, and shortly thereafter, there's a positive slope in the 50. This is a 50-week moving average, okay? There's your bow tie, and then shortly thereafter, there's a negative slope in the 50. So... Once a market is a trend is trending, everything works better with trend. It's just when that transition is beginning to happen is where you really have to pay attention. Okay, right now it looks like it's rolling over. I'm not going to shout it from the rooftop that said it's a top and bear market and run for the hills, but I am going to start putting some shorts on as I get triggered into them. I am going to honor my stops just in case. And I am going to be super selective on any new longs in the process. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any questions, anything so far? I know I kind of rushed through a lot of stuff here. Um, I get excited about research and I get kind of crammed into it right before I do these things. Uh, as usual, when things are less than ideal, i.e. now, you want to be super selective. So um, I think I might do a Labor Day sale on this. If you um, if you get the stock course, I'll give you a year of my service. In fact, I pretty much know I'm going to do that. So um, until you, unless you see a promo code up on my website, just uh, shoot me an email, and I'll make that happen for you. Uh, the other thing, I'm doing a welcome back campaign, and I'm not uh, I'm not contacting everyone. Just certain people I'm contacting that are in. Um, based on you know how they signed up for the service, because I contacted a lot of people a long time ago, and uh, this is a different campaign. But if you were pre previously on this trading service uh, and you want to come back on, let me know, and I'll, I'll cut you a, an awesome deal, screaming deal. What would I consider my edge? My edge is that when a market is going up, I am long. When a market is going down, I am short. When the market is going sideways, I am out, and that's my edge. Okay. Now, in a rip roaring bull market, that's an incredible edge. In a serious bear market, that's an incredible edge. In a choppy market, doesn't really do you much good. But you just sit on your hands, bide your time. 
Uh, $47 trial is back on the trading service. So if you just go to the, go to my store or go to the trading service page, and this is the promo code right here, trial, 47, T-R-I-A-L. Just punch that in, and you'll get the trial rate. Okay? All right, let's take a look at the uh, – we kind of beat the S&P to death. Let's take a look at the overall market. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks. Feel free to do so now. Uh, obviously, we had a big sell-off. I wouldn't get too excited. I mean, it's getting a little choppy in here on a daily chart. Again, let's take maybe let's take a look at a two-day or a three-day. And so far, or even a four-day, so far we're just kind of pulling back, as you can see. And so far, there's a lot of overhead supply. So you got your thrust down, and now this is the pullback. So you got thrust, pullback. It's that simple, okay? There's nothing mojo, mumbo jumbo, or whatever. No mojo to it. It's just thrust followed by pullback, and that's the type of market win. And also, you got this massive range up here. So what happens in a range? Anybody who bought is going to who bought who bought the market is going to be looking to get out at break even. Howard says S P ugly chart in Webster's dig Dictionary under oxymoron, they have SPX chart, pretty ugly. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty ugly chart, no matter how you slice it, okay? Now, sometimes the market will go shooting right back up through this range. It could do whatever it wants, okay? So you can't, you can't say with certainty that this is the bear market, this is the big one, but it's kind of starting to look that way, okay? Um, Ideally, I, I wish this market would go straight back up and all these signals wouldn't trigger and we dodge the mother of all bullets. I mean, this looked pretty ugly back here, too. OK. But as I said recently in my column, if you go all the way out to like a monthly chart. In total hindsight, that was just a trend dock out here. But now. OK, it really didn't go much higher from that trend knockout, that TKO. Because here, TKO, you get a nice, nice persistent trend. And then you had that, bam, that knockout move, knocks out some players, attracts some shorts in. When it gets squeezed out, it could pave the way for the market to head higher. Well, the market really didn't head much higher afterwards. And then now we have this next move here. Well, this is a little bit more concerning. This actually looks bullish once you take out this high. It looks kind of interesting. But in this particular case, this looks a little bit more of a knockout because the market is not stair-stepping higher. It's not doing this. It did this. It did that. And then it kind of kind of just barely got back to new highs, and now it's kind of back in again, okay? Kind of double topish, so to speak, or just not stair-stepping higher. So that's a bit of a concern at the S&P 500. Is there what? So what's the difference between daily and weekly chart? I'm, I'm 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 not sure. I fully understand the question. Uh, it's just patterns of fractal. If you're looking at a bow tie on a five minute chart, I mean we've got time today. Let's take a look at a bow tie on a five minute chart. See what that looks like. Let's use the spiders and see what we have. Now we're not coming off a of multi day lows. I wouldn't get too excited about it. But let's just see what happens on a five day. See, so right now, well, this would be a great this would be a great example here. On a five minute chart, you've got some resistance up here, and you've got the S&P beginning to roll over. So yeah, a bow tie to five minute chart might be worth watching because you're coming off of multi day highs here. So when this crosses this and this crosses this, then you have the signal. You wait for the pullback and then you look to short it. So same thing on a daily, same thing on a two-day, same thing on a five-day, and so on and so forth, okay? What is your turning point from sitting on your hands and going short? Um, that's a tough thing because they slide faster than they glide. But what I do is I listen to the database. We had a short position uh, a couple of months ago, even though the market was not too far from, from new highs. And as we start seeing shorts develop in the database, we start putting on more and more. This this thing begin to break down kind of quickly, and then you kind of you kind of rush again to, to short and try to catch up. Uh, 
and it's kind of doored if you do it, doored if you don't, especially when you get a slide like we just had, because you look at this retrace rally, and it's like you get short, then you get squeezed out of everything, okay? So it's kind of a, it kind of becomes an exercise in futility. There's no necessary line in the sand, but when you see that a market breaks down of its range, okay, like right here, okay, it broke down out of its range. You got a mountain of overhead supply. You better start paying attention, and you might want to look at the short side, and you might want to be super selective on your longs, and then just listen to your database and see what it says to do. Um, I can't show you these out of courtesy from a people, but if you take a look at today's Landry list, we've got a plethora of shorts setting up, okay? Turning point from sitting your hands going short. Yeah, you just you just listen to the database. As you start getting a lot of short setups, you start shorting. I, I think the secret to markets is, is being, if there is a secret, or one of the secrets is – is letting that database tell you what to do and getting in tune with that database. And if you're getting a plethora of short setting up, then you need to be shorting. Like right now, okay, because the market's selling off, the, the IPOs no longer look so great. The IPOs were looking fantastic last couple of years, and now they're looking a little dubious or they're not looking as good as they look. There's one or two out there doing okay, might be worth a shot. We'll see. But a while back, they were looking pretty good. So you want to be trading IPOs when they're looking good. You want to be shorting stocks when they're not looking so good. And if you carefully look at what the database is throwing out, if it's throwing out one long and 40 shorts, then it's like, well, hello, let's look at the overall market. It's kind of rolling over, too. The sector has rolled over. Maybe I should be taking some of those shorts, okay? Uh, what I've been doing lately, just because it looks like the overall market, I've just been using the uh, what I call the major mid groups, the, 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 the industry groups as opposed to the sub-industries as far as uh, illustrative purposes, for illustrative purposes. I still look at all 239 of these um, subsectors each day, but as far as, or when it comes to the uh, just showing you what's going on, because all the sectors, or 99% of the sectors, look like the overall market, we've just been focusing on that. Uh, let me just finish up the NASDAQ real quick. Obviously, NASDAQ has broken down, and so far, this is just a little bit of a pullback. I wouldn't get too excited about this just yet, unless, of course, it busts through this range, okay? Russell 2000 is just not looking good at all. You got a pretty serious slide here. Let's measure this. Let's see what that is. On a closing basis, yeah, that's 15%. That's pretty serious. I think the, the media gets all excited when it's – I think they declare a bear market at 20%. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think that's the big, big excitement for the media. So based on that metric – we're not too far away from a bear market in Russell. Um, the Rusty, if you go back and watch these presentations, I talked about the fact that the Russell 2000 had a pretty clean two-day bow tie back here, and that was kind of cool. And then even if you look at like a three-day, four-day, and a weekly, you can see now you have a weekly bow tie. So that's kind of interesting. Now, just getting back to these major bigs, they kind of look like the market itself. Most of them, or quite a few of them, just recently hit new highs and then have subsequently sold off and pulled back. So the sector action is looking not so good at this juncture, for lack of a more eloquent way of putting it. Now, gold, the commodity is trying to bottom out, trying being the key word in that sentence. It does have some overhead supply to overcome, and I am seeing a few setups that are looking kind of interesting in here. And that's kind of cool because when the market is questionable, going sideways, and are rolling over, you certainly want to be very selective in your stock selection. And when it's rolling over, it's cool when you could get commodities setting up because they could trade contra the overall market. I am seeing some of these 
little lower tier, cheap, speculative oil companies beginning to bottom out in here a little bit. So I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we'll start seeing some bottoms there. So we can, at least we can put some longs in the books to go along with all the shorts that we're seeing lately. So it'd be nice to get in these commodities and have them rally. I mean, in an ideal world, that'd be a wonderful thing. But don't just buy them just because they're at low levels. The question is silver. Gold looks a little bit better than silver. Silver still looks a little questionable in here. And silver, silver is always going to be more volatile than gold. I guess that's a, I guess that's a, you can't say that. All, but silver so far in my career has been more volatile than gold. Try trading silver futures contracts and you'll, you'll learn really quick that it's pretty crazy. Gold's very tame compared to silver. Howard says 10% is a correction and 20% is a bear market. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, does it matter? No. I mean, just pay attention to what's going on in the market and listen to your database is the bottom line. But I hear you. Uh, Investors Business Daily recently did an IPO website and have a new IPO course. Yeah, Michael, um, somebody emailed me on that. Um, it looks uh, looks kind of familiar. <laughs> I guess that's a nail in the coffin, you know, when IBD gets around to doing a course on something. Um, you know, I waited a year before I did the course, and, and uh, finally I couldn't say it anymore. So well, I got to do a course, and I hope that's not the nail in the coffin. Um, but, yeah, well, my course is about a third of the price, and I've got a money-back guarantee. So check mine out first. Uh, I would strongly urge you to do that. But, no, I haven't checked out their website. Big Dave, single bow tie, set up first thrust or first bucks. Where is the entry on the SPY? All right. Well, on the SPY, you had a daily bow tie here, and I guess your entry would have been here. Now, of course, it did kind of rally up, but it never did take out that uh, top. Okay. Now, I don't want to say, oh, we'll just trade the bow ties, and they're always going to catch the top. Well, it caught the top, but... Would you have got stopped out here? Probably, okay. Um, that's a one-day chart. Let's take a look at a two-day chart. Uh, two-day chart, you kind of got to squint your eyes, but I guess the signal would have been – two-day chart really didn't kind of materialize. Let's take a look at like a three-day, a four-day. A four-day hasn't triggered yet because now you're in the pullback mode. You got the crossing, and then now you have the pullback. You've got a higher high. I'm sorry, you got two higher lows. You not. You probably won't get a higher high in this. Otherwise, it it would be going back to new highs. Does that help? If it doesn't interrupt your flow, can you define a pivot? Oh, I'll be happy to, Jim. Pivot point's pretty simple. Um, I think some people maybe make too much over them, but they, they can be useful. A pivot point is just a high surrounded by two lower highs. Okay. Or a low surrounded by two higher lows. Okay, so it gives you a little structure to work around when you have a pivot point. Sometimes, let's say you have a pullback, and I call this a, a false rally pullback or a trend pivot pullback. So if you hit a pivot point in a pullback, this kind of fakes in some people sometimes. And then the market sells off. So it's kind of like a, it's hard to explain, but like kind of a mini trend knockout type of thing. It's a fake out. Let's not call it a trend knockout, complicate things. So when you have that pivot point, it could help to remember the market is all about faking out. It's like you, it's like, what's a good way of putting this? Market is is the market's going to fake you out and shake you out. So the secret is to try to not get shaken out and try not to get faked out. So 
you see this pullback here, this would have been your sell triggers, right? And then what's the market done since? It's kind of rallied up a little bit. So in this particular case, now that you have this structure to work around this pivot point, your entry would be below this pivot point. Let's say you totally missed this trade, which it would have been hard to get in on that gap down anyway. Then your new entry would be below this pivot point because that gives you a little bit of structure to work around because you know some people got faked, faked in or faked out, however you want to look at it around that point. So does that help? Oh, you got me. Okay, good. Okay. Gold too volatile to trade per conventional wisdom, yet HV of gold is 12 and HV of spy is 21. As you say, danger, non-volatile stuff, that becomes volatile. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I preach. Uh, it's it's um, it's better the devil you know. That's kind of interesting. Well, the, the GLD, you got to realize that's an ETF based on the commodity. And yeah, it only has an HV of 12, but it's it's the derivative nature of how they're doing this that compresses that volatility down. If you're out there trading gold futures contracts, it's probably a little bit different type of um, type of HV than uh, than the S&P futures. But I hear you. Yeah, it's better to vol better the devil you know. I mean, it's better to go in on a volatile market. And know it's going to be volatile and adjust your share sizes accordingly than to go in something that's that's less volatile, thinking that you have some sort of safe haven. In fact, on the short side, it, you'll notice today I've got like a major company, huge company, as one of the shorts. And the reason being is that I think everybody has become complacent by being long this stock for the last 10, 20 years. And now it looks like it's finally beginning to roll over. And that that I'm looking for that volatility to come back to the market. Is symmetrical triangle or a pendant pattern in the S&P 500? I don't, I don't, I'm not really into triangles that much. I've never really found much of a use for them. I mean, no offense to those of you who trade them. Uh, I don't know where you would draw it on this chart. Uh, you know, maybe you connect these lows. and I don't know where you get a symmetrical triangle, I guess, would be this. I don't know where you're going to get that. Are you talking shorter term? Uh, I'm not a big fan of, you know, are you saying this is a – Symmetrical triangle. I don't know. Uh, it's it's something I'm not a big fan of. I, I just see it as kind of a market pulling back to kind of faked out lower. Yeah, Frenchie, I wouldn't. You know, I'm just not a big fan of that. Study it on your own. If it's something you want to get into, uh, then go for it. It's like I've, I've studied everything in the world, and I've kind of taken an a la carte approach. And I think you have to kind of take an a la carte approach. And it, it, it amazes me that some people that have been around for a long, long time are emailing me like, hey, I'm trying this, I'm trying that, or I think I'm going to start trying this pattern of yours. And it's kind of like, you know, what have you been doing for the last 10, 20 years? Do you have some sort of structure you've been working around? It's okay to learn some new things and try some new things, but just make sure you have some sort of core methodology you're working around for me it's like it's pullbacks okay now i've put a lot of twists and spins on it in the money management and all these other things but i have a core methodology in, in place that's why i call it my core trading service i guess it's one of the reasons because i have this core methodology and there's some things that are on the fringe a little bit but for the most part i'm sticking with the trend i'm sticking with the entries i'm sticking with the you know the complete methodology the core methodology stick it to the core Whereas it seems like, you know, I'm glad people are trying things. I'm glad they're discovering me and, and all. But, you know, what have you been doing for the last 20 years? When I say discovering me, they're discovering my patterns, I should say. These are people that I've known on and off for, for many years. So, but, yeah, if you want to make triangles part of your work, then 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 do a tremendous amount of work on that. We, um, yeah, I know some people that just trade certain little, little patterns, something that's a little bit more obscure, but that's all they do. And they focus on that, and they've spent a considerable part of their lives doing that, and they get pretty good at it, okay? But don't rush out and say, well, they're doing it. They seem successful. Let me just take their pattern, and, and you know, you, you've got to find something that makes sense to you, whether it's my, you know, it's not my way or highway. If my stuff makes sense, then use it. If not, find something else, okay? Don says, just buy F. F. A la carte approach me. Um a la carte, 
Well, when when I, when I often use the word a la carte is if you could take Dave a la carte, a la carte means like you just um, you go somewhere and like uh, it's a food reference. She's like, oh, I like some some of this and I like some of that, as opposed to just getting your plate with your your uh, dinner on it. You you pick pick and choose what you want. Pick and choose. So if you already have an established methodology, then what I would say is take my stuff and use it a la carte meaning that you take the pieces that make a lot of sense to you. Like I've helped some people in the past who, who are successful uh, on the institutional side. They, they, they like some of the position and management stuff that I do. So they still trade the stocks the way they trade them, but they take some of that position management. So it's sort of a la carte, the pieces that they like. And that's why I say it's not my way or highway, because I think there, there, there are different ways to skate a cat. There's different ways to trade the markets. But some people like little little pieces of what I do, and that's that's flattering for me too. Okay. But I think you gotta be careful if you if your whole approach is a la carte, where you're just like grabbing a piece of this, a piece of that, uh you, you know, not to pick up the triangles, but you grab the triangles, you're grabbing the 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 Gartley, you're grabbing the you know, you take it all these different things. And I'll see bloggers and it's like every day they're talking about a different indicator or a different uh, technical pattern. It's kind of like, it's like my wife once said, you know, how many systems do you really need? It's like, and if I see somebody that's, that's talking about a different approach every day, to me that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. Now, if they're a, a research analyst and they're showing you all these different things, then then I think that's kind of fun and cool. But if they're actually running money then it's kind of like well, wait a minute this guy's all over the place what is he doing it's kind of like curly and, and, and city slickers you know and he he holds up his finger and that's like the secret it's like one thing so you need to do one thing and do it well i mean trade trade triangles if that's what you like trade pullbacks if that's what you like but get good at what get good at one thing and stick with it okay rick says Hi, Dave. This is Rick. I recognize the name, former student of yours, and subscriber three times over the last five years. Feel free to advise your peeps, acknowledge your methodology, be responsible. That I acknowledge your methodology for being responsible for my account growing this year from 160K to 199K plus. 39,000 divided by 160 equals 24% year to date. That's good in anybody's book. Your system works. Thank you, Richard. And, and you know, this year's been a tough year. You've really had to work at it to make things work. But, yeah, we've had some pretty good setups so far this year uh, based on the methodology. Alan says, what does that tell you about the character of a person who is all over the place chasing new systems every day? Um, I think they need to – I think they need to – I hate to say you got to grow up sometime, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. It's kind of like – you got to grow up sometimes. You got to find you got to find one thing and stick to it. Um, the market markets are pretty simple when you when you boil it all down. I never said they were easy. It's just they're pretty simple. And the older I get, the the more stuff I've peeled away. It's like early in your career, you keep adding things on, thinking that's going to help, and then later in your career, you start peeling things off, and you get back to the you get back to the chart, you get back to the basics. Okay. And now I play with, I still play with moving averages, but I mean, early on, I was putting 100 moving averages on my chart. Nothing wrong with doing that. I know some people out there that do that, but make that your life's work to just obsess over moving averages and put 100 moving averages on your chart. That's fine. But I found that you kind of just start peeling things off. So that tells me if someone's just constantly chasing things, either they, they fail to realize that there is no holy grail and they got to keep chasing things. Uh, or they're, they're, they've never been consistent. I, I, I don't know. Are they consistent in their in their in their real life, or, or they just kind of bounce all over the place? Or do they change careers every so often? Do they change jobs every so often? I, mean, I don't know. I can't make a, a I can't make an assumption based on what I'm seeing on the trading side because I know I know very successful doctors who are also entrepreneurs. And they run their their real estate business and their uh, their their doctor firm. What do you call it when you have um, partners and and you buildings and whatever? They run a doctor entrepreneurial business, 
a certain way and they run their real estate business a certain way. But if it comes to trading, they're all over the place and there's something completely different. Um, you know, maybe they're just trying to – that's a release for them or they don't, they, they don't have to act in the same way they act in a business. I don't know. I mean, if you're around me on a Saturday night, you're like, well, this guy just drinks beer, you know? I mean, so if you're just looking at that microcosm. But, yeah, if their whole life is like that, then that's that's a pretty scary thing. But the markets are not a good place to to try a lot of stuff out, okay? Run a practice. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank you, Scott. It's so hard practice. Thank you, Nate. <laughs> it's so hard. Thank you, Michael. It's so Michael's a, a doctor. Uh, it's so hard to like uh, when you're actually broadcasting to come up with the right word sometime. Okay, Frank says on last comment, 1,000% right. If you don't stick with it and this and think this time is the one exception, especially when it comes to stops, you get crushed. Absolutely. Okay. Let's go back to some of these older questions here. Oh, uh, yeah, let's let's open it up for stocks, too, if we haven't already done so. APL. Um, the question about Apple is, is it a death cross or well, when did a death cross? Let's take a look at that. Um, I wrote a column a while back. It's a stick of fork in Apple. Apple's kind of hard to trade, though, so I wasn't excited about rushing out and shorting it. Um, but as far as uh, being done, I think it's a uh, – I think it's done. And, you know, the problem with Apple is Apple always comes back. And I think that some people are sucked into believing that it'll always come back. And, you know, like life, uh, that'll work or, until it don't. Some things will work until they just absolutely don't. So you, you can't you can't believe. You can't believe that. OK, there's your death cross. But, I mean, seriously, this thing has had a pretty serious breakdown before. You can't sit around and wait for this moving average across before uh, taking some sort of action. So what's the question? Apple death crossed last week. Yeah. Okay. What do you think about, okay, uh, Lucio, we'll get to those. Um, do me a favor, would you ask about, well, let me bang those out real quick because otherwise I'll forget. Uh, when you ask about a stock, just ask about one stock and then hit enter. And that way I could I could do them and then hit uh, return so I don't get mixed up. But, yeah, well, let me go through those real quick. R-D-U-S. Um, this, you know, it, I'm going to be like Mikey. Mikey is a kid that he hates everything, okay? Uh, I'm probably going to be like Mikey this week, so let me just warn you ahead of time. Uh, this is a – in this particular case – uh, this looks like a possible short. You've got a thrust lower, and then you've got a pullback. So, yes, it looks like a possible short. My only problem is you've got a lot of support just below the market. Also, the HV is 65. Usually I like a high HV, but on the short side, I'm a little bit more inclined to like stocks with a slightly lower HV because shorts could be kind of crazy. I'd almost rather short a um, – um, what am I looking for? I can't. I want to say the name of it because we're, but I, I'm gonna give it away. Uh, but a, a stock with a lower volatility and, and maybe a less uh, exciting feel at this point. If you read the uh, Go Go Nomo on my website under special reports, I think that'll um, you see where I'm coming from. Okay, Halo. Um, yeah, this is a little volatile. Yeah, it's a short. It's a possible short. It is a biotechnology, so you'd have to be kind of careful. You do have a little support down here. Uh, I think you could probably find something slightly more cleaner, but it's not bad as a as a possible short. So you could certainly do much worse than that. AMBA. Yeah, AMBA is already broken down, um, so it's it's too late to go in as a new position. So you'd have to wait for it to set up again, and then SKX Skeeters. Skechers. Yeah, we talked about Skechers last week. Skechers looks like a possible short. Uh, the only thing now is you got one, two, three, four, five, six. You got eight days, okay? So maybe if it takes out this low, but if it goes a few more days without taking out this low in earnest, then I would take it off your screen just because on the short side, I usually like them to trigger pretty quickly, okay? I guess technically it did already trigger because you do have this sell-off here, so... So, yeah, technically it's already triggered. If you short, stay short. Uh, if not, I think it's still viable below like 135 in here, maybe a little bit lower just to give it a little room. 
another nice seminar. Make that webinar TSCO for Steve. TSCO. Got some friendlies here today. That's nice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this stock's in trouble. You got all this overhead supply to deal with. Let's take a look at the uh, zoom it a little bit. The only problem that I'm having with some of these charts, and this this is another case of they just slide so much faster than they glide, and things just kind of blow up on the short side, and then it's kind of hard to to, to um, pick up the pieces and get in or whatever. So taking a look at this, you could see that. The HV in the stock is only 26, and it went from here. Well, we don't have a good low. It, it, it lost like 30% of its value over a short period of time, and that's a, a huge deal for a lower volatility stock like this. So the magnitude of the move based on the volatility, I think I would avoid it. But, you know, you like here goes the Mikey thing. Um, I hate everything. It, it, it still looks like it's in trouble, obviously. Lucio says, I put an order to sell SKX on the 2808 at 135. It activates Widow, put a stop at 148. What do you think of that strategy today if, if I inputted the order? Uh, well, we don't want to get it to too, uh, we don't want to get into too many specifics because uh, I don't want to be uh, perceived as direct trading advice. But let's say if you're getting in below this low, a stock like this, you probably want to stop. If you're trying to swing to intermediate term trading, you probably want to stop somewhere up here because you got a little bit of resistance. And obviously, if it goes on to make new highs, then you're wrong. But if it gets all the way back up to here, then there's a chance you could be wrong on a trade. So always ask yourself, where do you think I would be wrong? Obviously, at new highs, you'd be wrong. And then just figure out somewhere between those new highs and where we are, where you'd be likely wrong, okay? Thanks. That's what I needed. You're welcome, Jim. I forgot what I said, but uh, you're welcome. Those are structured pivots. Floor traders or older traders use a DMARC calculated pivot. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know what a DMARC calculated pivot is, but I'm not a big fan of in, any type of complex analysis. Now, Mr. DMARC is is very famous. I don't know him personally. It's one of the few guys I actually don't know in the industry. Uh, but I know he gets a lot of credit for a lot of things and, and I've never really, I started studying his stuff years ago and it's like, you got these sequential counts and it's one, it's two, and then it resets. And, and I think it Mr. DeMarc's head. I think he understands fully his methodology, but for me, it's, it's again, let, let me just strip things off a little bit and just go back to the charts and just listen to what the chart is saying. Like Tom McClellan in his column recently, you know, it was pointed out by one of the viewers, uh, Karen, a couple of weeks ago, it's a, uh, you know, he was at a conference with some money managers and they're like, well, can you define a trend? Can you define a trend? And one of the guys on the, on the, uh, on the panel, and this was in a, one of Tom's recent columns or blogs, whatever, uh, from Alabama, he says, is you is, or is you isn't in a trend. And it's like, you know, sometimes you need to just, you know, forget about what count of the bar or wave or oscillator, inverted, whatever is telling you or a third derivative. And just ask yourself, is your is or is your isn't in a trend? And, and I think that's I think that's a, an important way of looking at things. So is the market trending or not? Now, when it gets into an emerging trend like right now, that's where it becomes a little more difficult. 1999, it's going up. 2008, it's going down. 2009, it's going up. Okay? It's everything in between that takes a little bit more work. And right now, it looks like it's rolling over. Okay? Doesn't mean it can't go back up. But right now, you have to play it as if, this rollover will last forever, or at least a significant time, or at least long enough to profit from it. So don't overcomplicate things. Pete says taco. Oh, I could go for a taco. That's where are you, Pete? Let's go get some taco. Oh, taco. T a c o. Um. Well, it's in a downtrend. That's for sure. It's a little on the thin side. Probably hard to borrow as a short. Uh, it's not really set up, though. It kind of pulled back just a smidgen here. But, yeah, you know, is you is or is you is it at a trend? It's, it's, it looks like it's at a downtrend. 
Karen, if you hear, who was uh, – let me know the name of the guy who said that. I don't know if you're here this week. You didn't like the HB. Couldn't understand your phrasing. Didn't like the HB. HB? Do we even talk about HB? What's HB? All right, you lost me, Joe. Yeah, IBKR, that's that's been a short. That's um that's been on my lander list for a while as a possible short. Good eye on that. It's already triggered though. Uh it might still be viable below this uh this low in here. But yeah, it's certainly rolled over. It's kind of a little bumpy ride lower. It does have some support down here. That's probably why I didn't put it on as official setup. But yeah, if you back the chart way out. You know, these are the kind of stocks that I'm looking at right now. They're not splitting the atom. Uh, they're a brokerage firm, okay? They're not developing some sort of um, peptides or whatever you call those things a biotechnology company's developed that's going to cure Ebola or cancer or something like that. They're just a brokerage. Now, they're, I'm not saying they're anything bad about them, but I'm saying they're a brokerage, just like a, a taco maker or something like that might be a good short right now, okay? But you can see by back of the chart way out, they've done really well for a long time. So anybody who bought them from here all the way to here is happy now. But as this thing begins to sell off, their profits begin to evaporate. Easy for me to say. So just remember when it comes to technical analysis, what is the chart telling you? What are the people behind those bars? We just I just mentioned Tom McClellan. That reminds me of what Tom said at one of our, our after meetings. It's like he said, would you buy a stock? I don't know you people who have heard me say this a thousand times, but I'll say it again. It's just such a good thing to point out. Would you buy a stock? You're not only forming a relationship between you and the company and you expect the company to go, do good things, but you're also forming a relationship between anyone who's ever bought the stock in the past. And as Tom says, those people will screw you. And his mother once said, um, rest in peace, she's no longer with us, but his mother once said, as Tom quoted to me, I never met his mother, but quoted to me, um, said that th people buy stocks, to paraphrase her, people buy stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy stocks when they have money. Some people sell stocks when they need money. And others use far sophisticated methods, maybe like counting those little bars to get a, a certain pivot based on the count of the count of the count of the reset of the count, you know? So... <laughs> Never forget that those people will screw you. So peel away all that stuff and look at a chart like IBKR, and what do you see? Well, it looks like a lot of people were happy for a long, long time. And does that happiness end now? Possibly. All right, CZR, that's going to be a casino. Uh, no. No, it's too wide and loose. I mean, it's it's. I hear you. It's tried to bottom out a little bit in here, but it's just too wide and loose. Look at this HV, 148 for a casino. That's just ridiculous. That's too much. And then you got overhead supply. Uh, no. Phil likes CLF. You always get something good out of Phil. Yeah, a little overhead resistance. I've been watching this one. I've been paid. I I saw this little pullback here. Uh, nice little cup and handle down here, pull back, feel you on the service. So you saw it back then too. Um, also had a bow tie or something around that area. Well, not quite, but it was a first thrust. So yeah, it looked great back here. And so far it's had a nice little pop out, but I just didn't like the overhead supply. I mean, in hindsight, it's like, well, I still would take it in hindsight, but I mean, obviously yeah, it'd be nice to have 25%, but it just... I just couldn't get excited about it based on the amount of overhead supply. But, yeah, I think it looks like a bottom. But I think it's going to have its work cut out for it getting through that uh, resistance. Okay. NKE, that probably could be a good short. Did I just say probably? Yeah, the only problem here is that it's just got this big spiky look to it, and it's a pretty low HV stock. I mean, it was, it looks okay. I mean, it's mostly just this one wide range bar, and it's all come all the way back up. Uh, I think it's probably in trouble. I know you look at the 50-day moving average, so let's just let's see if we could figure out the fill trade here. Is that the 50 weight on there? Wow, that can't be right. No, it's 200. Let's take a look at the 50. Where'd it go?
I got a screen I can't find. Let's see if I can find it. Where are you? Here we go. There it is. All right. Oh, I see what he's doing. Okay. Phil likes to do like a throwback to the 50. I hear you. Yeah, based on that, I hear you. Um, it just doesn't really jump out at me. I can't argue with you, though. I mean, I hear you. It looks okay. I'm selling five stocks because I want to risk a 2% of my $4,000. Am I risking 14 points? Um, I don't understand the question, but if you have... To keep the math easy, usually use a 100K account. And you can adjust to your account size accordingly, obviously. And uh, it would be great if I publish a spreadsheet, but I can't do that because live trades are in there. Um, let's say you got 100,000 and you're risking 2%. So that means 2,000 per trade. Now, that doesn't mean that you buy $2,000 worth of stock. If your stop STOP is at let's say five dollars, okay, away, then you would buy what would that be? Two thousand divided by five would be what four hundred shares divided by five equals yeah four hundred shares. So you would buy four hundred shares, and regardless of what the price stock of the price is, okay. So that's how you you come up with the money management, and hopefully that made sense. I've I've kind of beat the dead horse on that ad nauseum, um, not to mix metaphors, but uh, go in and um, watch the YouTubes as many as you can stand. Hi, Dave. Great webinar. How about TZA? TZA? TZA. Um, well, this looks good. Okay, don't get me wrong. Uh, the problem is with these inverse shorts and all these other things is that the tracking errors are abysmal. And... They could be really super crazy volatile. Um, as an experiment, I tried to use them in my momentum list to try to shore up that list when the conditions got iffy. And it just created so much volatility in the list. It just wasn't even worth it. So um, I'm not a fan of day trading, but maybe maybe look at these things as possible day trades. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold them long, I mean, especially with the leverage and all. And here's the thing, too. The leverage doesn't work if you're position trading because the stock is three times more volatile than the normal underlying instrument, than the underlying instrument. So you would trade one third the amount of stock. So it all kind of washes out. But if you are day trading, maybe, okay, um, I, would, I would encourage you not to do it, but maybe there's, maybe you could trade these things or that I should say that would be the only way. I would consider doing something like that and be on a day trade. Low HB stock, you keep saying uh, HV is in victory, uh, historical volatility, and I have it on my chart right here. Let's see if it'll, if I can make it shine up. You can't see it, but uh, on on my other screen it says HV. This just historical volatility. If you want the, if you want the formula. For TC, I have it. If you want it for Metastock, uh, instead of firing up Metastock, I just I, I'll do a, a Google search and I'll give it to you. So you could just do a Google search and get it the same way. But feel free to email me on this. Is Ultra finally breaking down? ULTA Ulta? That's going to be a cosmetics company. Uh, well, it, it's got again, it's got too big of this big spiky bar, and that's what happens with a lot of these setups or a lot of the stocks in here. Um, I would just avoid it based on that structure. The way the market broke down, it's just too hard to trade a lot of these in here. Dave, you see DBN as a short or any oils is a good short option option right now for Aaron. Aaron, how are things over there in Mississippi? I always forget where you are. You're in Jackson? I got some stuff on Craigslist you can pick up for me. <laughs> I'll give you 50 bucks. Uh, save me 50 bucks of gas. Let's see. You – what? Which one are we looking at? DVN. Um, in the oils, let's take a look at USO real quick. Um, in the oils, I would be more excited about trying to buy them now 
as opposed to trying to short them. But they, they looks like a longer term trend downtrend. Yeah, they are, but they're kind of beat up in here. Okay, so they've been going down forever. That's what oil's doing. Now, what are stocks doing? Well, stocks have been going up forever, and now they're beginning to go down. Stocks look like that. So if anything, I kind of see oil as beginning to look like this a little bit. So I would uh, I would avoid trying to short oil at this particular point in time. I think it's a little too late to the game. Okay. If anything, I keep an eye out for some possible long opportunities in uh, in oils. Okay. Okay. Martin wants to know. Okay, we got that one. Okay, we got that one. Okay, NDRM, that's going to be a, a biotech or a skin company for derm. Um, it looks okay. Uh, I'm not really crazy about buying anything at this juncture, but sometimes IPOs can be inefficient and, and do well in spite of the overall market. So maybe on pullbacks along the way, it could do okay. Remember, we talked we talked about this quite a bit. Uh, I'm not a big fan of breakouts, but in newer issues such as this, sometimes breakouts could work. As you can see, this one worked pretty nicely. Yeah, I watch my broker, of course. <laughs> Maybe Jim meant historical volatility. Yeah, historical volatility. GYRO, going, going, going. GYRO for Brian. Gyro? We were we were at um, we were at the um, Greek and Lebanese restaurant the other day, and my wife and I we usually get a salad when we go there. The guy next to us sat down, businessman, uh, well dressed businessman, sat down and he had a, a gyro. It just looked um, what do you call him a gyro? Gyro <laughs> just looked delicious. And I joked to my wife and said, "Pardon me, sir, may I have a bite of your gyro?" <laughs> anyway, I digress. Um, no, the volume is too low on this. Uh, I don't know if you're thinking about trading this. But, yeah, it just looks like uh, crud. Volume's too low to even think about trading that. Until it's getting close to lunchtime, talk about food. Ever since it brought up taco, thanks a lot. I'm half kidding. ALDR? Good, uh, good questions today. Uh, glad you guys are here and girls. Uh, yeah, this one looks like it's in trouble. Uh, it's biotechnology. It's the only thing that's a little scary. Not that I won't short a biotech, but that's the only caveat. A uh, little support down here, but hey, you know what? If it drops from 40 down to 25, I'll be happy. So yeah, I think that's a, a, a viable setup. The volume is okay. Yeah, the volume is good. You could you could do that. G-Y-R-O equals hero. G they you taught a hero sandwich too? G-Y-R-O equal hero. G Y R P. I don't know what you're saying, Joe. You lost me. G Y R P. Oh, you want to buy L A R D R? Oh, I hope it didn't beat you up on that. A L D R. Is it long? No, no, that'd be a short. Interesting oils. Um. I actually like the commodity itself at this juncture, but there's some lower tiered oil companies. I really can't talk about them. They're kind of low priced and speculative, but uh, dig through your database. There's a few in there. SCMP for Mr. Reese. SCMP. Um, it's in an uptrend, but it's kind of got this uh, choppy wide and loose range to it. So I think I'd leave it alone. Um, as I often say, when the market is iffy, I tend to look for perfection more. MX for Don. No, it's got the big gap down. Are you going to ask about that every week? Pronounce hero or euro? Giro. Hero, euro, giro? Giro or gyro? What do you call those things? I've never ordered one. <laughs> they look good, though. Not gyro. <laughs> gyro. It's a gyro? <laughs> okay. Pronounce gyro. All right. Lucio. Lucio. Gyro. 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 
Hero. The G is silent. All right. Hero. All right. No wonder why I never had one. I'd order them, and they they never would come. I was ordering the wrong thing all this time. BX for Susan. Uh, Looks like it's in trouble. And see, this is asset management. They're not splitting the atoms. So this would be... Uh, this type of stock would be more interested in shorting at this juncture, especially since the financials, take a look at financials real quick, uh, tend to get whacked. Well, you got this big wide range bar. It's kind of screwed things up. But um, it's a little chopped. There's no real setup here for me. I guess it's set up kind of back here and it sold off. Uh, I hear you, though, Susan. I think it's in trouble. Um, but there's no real setup there. So maybe if it pulls back a little bit or maybe below this low. But, yeah, it's definitely in a downtrend. Pronounced gyro, gyro. We have an argument over this. <laughs> Wasn't there a sign fell over gyros or euros? How to pronounce gyro? Okay, gyro. Is that better? Gyro. <laughs> Call him kebab. Easier. There you go. It's gyro. Oh jeez, jeez. I didn't think we'd have such a uh, <laughs> controversy. <laughs> um. This one's on my momentum list, and, and sometimes when the market gets kind of questionable, uh, something like foods can can trade contra to the over market. Although, if you take a look at the industry, the industry's not really doing that well. Um, if you plot the industry comparison, I did a, a YouTube on this, by the way. People always ask me how I do this. You can see the industry's not doing so good, so I wouldn't rush out and buy foods just because we're in a bit of a questionable market. But, uh, yeah, it's up near new highs, maybe on pullbacks. But, again, it's, it's hard for me to get excited about anything. I saw this one set up, and I did not take it just because it's so hard to, for me to get excited about the long side. Pronounce year oh, Euro. All right. Well, good. I'm going to order one next time I go. thing that scares me on Apple is – 5,070 funds own it and it's very large position for many of them when they start to sell. Yeah, Phil, you know, I love the way you think and I'm always giving Phil some loving and that's not just because he's on the service, but Phil kind of noodles with things and thinks about things and, and, and it puts a little logic to him and it just makes a lot of sense. Uh, not that there's any problem with you people out there doing all this more uh, complex kind of analysis. I mean, if that's what you want to do, do it. But, I like the way Phil looks at things. So let's think about this. We got, let's just say 5,000 round numbers. You got 5,000 funds that are holding Apple. Now, let's say they're holding it from a long time ago or even six months ago or whatever. They've got a nice profit there. They have to show a profit or ideally they want to show a profit, right, to their shareholders. So they might have to, at some point, they might have to sell that Apple and lock it in. Think about window dressing, okay? If you are a, a portfolio manager, you want to make sure you got those go-go, pretty shiny stocks. Okay, window dressing, to those of you who aren't from the States, is when you put like these nice uh, little outfits or clothes on the mannequins in the front of the store to kind of make everything look nice and pretty. Like, ooh, look at this fancy store, you know, so fancy. I want to go in there, right? So window dressing in stocks would be like you put these stocks in the portfolio. So when the client looks at the portfolio, like right at the end of the quarter or whenever, they'll go, oh, they've got Apple. Apple is so fancy. I love Apple, right? Well, what's going to happen when Apple becomes, um, pardon my speech, a, a turd, okay? Well, then, you know, you better get that out of the portfolio at some point. And as I think Phil's alluding to, what's going to happen if everybody runs for the door at the same time? And that could get pretty ugly. All right, give me some. I can't, I can't click on video links on how to pronounce Euro or Euro. So uh, you have to email me those. And I, by next week, well, I'm going to practice all week, and uh, I'll be able to, to uh, say it. Okay, let's squeeze it a couple of more. WTW, this one, uh, this is Weight Watchers. This has caught my eye uh, quite a bit. My only problem with it is that it does have a lot of um, uh, overhead supply to deal with back here. And I don't like this gap. I know this gap was 100% ago. I guess it would be a good problem to have. But, yeah, um, Don, I think it's bottoming out. It's got a little overhead supply to overcome. Uh, maybe on the next setup. This was on my list 
recently as a possible setup back here. But uh reason I didn't take it or put it on the service was because of the overhead supply. Okay. Convince me to sell Apple. Well, Joe, I don't want to. I'm not trying to talk you into selling it. I'm just saying, I'm just kind of stating the uh, the obvious. FCX, six day after at least 10 year low. Maybe a buyer at 20 EMA starts to slope higher at five and eight. Okay. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about those moving averages so much. I would just take a look at the price first and for, foremost. And it's kind of a bit of a, what I would call a micro first thrust. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of interesting. See, in a case like this, you know, but Dave, the arrow's pointing down. Well, yeah, but it, it's just sold out. It looks like it's went down forever. And now, at least on a micro level, you got a thrust higher. You got a little pullback. Um, it's a little bit riskier setup. And it has an HV. HV is a victory of 93. So that's kind of extreme. But, yeah, I think it might be worth a shot. Uh, it's a pioneer trade, meaning that, like the American pioneers, you're either going to get the gold or you're going to get an arrow shot into your back. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile as a trade. So I can't give you a high five on it because it's kind of a dangerous type of trade. But I like it, and I hear what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah, BTU is another one. Just too crazy. That's one that um, that I couldn't put in my service. Look at the HV on that. It's nearly 200 Next week, I'll be able to say HV and Euro. Or Euro. Um, man, you guys are making me hungry. It looks fantastic if you didn't look at how volatile it is. So it is kind of crazy volatile, but I hear you. And this was set up back here. And then it's also the mother of all bow ties. My bow tie is not working today. There they are. If you back the chart way out. So, yeah, this has turned a corner. So these are the kind of stocks you want to be buying right now. The stocks, these these commodity stocks that maybe are on the cusp of turning the corner. You're still fighting the longer term downtrend, but the little trend, the new trend could be emerging to the upside. And if it works, they could have tr uh, tremendous opportunities. That one's just uh, a little bit too volatile for my taste. Uh, but, yeah, I hear you, Scott. Good, uh, good eye on that. How do you know the traders will still own the overhead supply? Maybe that's why it went down. Uh, you don't. You don't, David. And and I've you know, heard of people with volume counting methods or whatever, uh, but you don't. But what you have to assume is that uh, do you really think that everyone who owned the stocks of the S&P 500 sold them a week ago? Okay, I don't know. Maybe they did. I don't know. There's no way of knowing that, but I highly doubt it. OK, I know a lot of people who are still hanging on. I know people calling me up worried about the market. OK, well, th these aren't the trader types. These are these are friends and relatives. They. Are still holding. OK, so I have a feeling that's a microcosm of what's going on out there. The other thing you got to remember, too, Phil just mentioned 5000 funds holding Apple. Well, I had a friend that used to run five billion dollars, and I think it, at the height of its of the fund, it might have been even like six or seven or eight billion dollars. Well, you got to realize that although he's active, it's kind of like turning a battleship. Okay, he cannot dump five billion dollars worth of stock on the market at one time. Okay, it's like steering a battleship. Like, oh, we better start getting out. You know, he might be selling into this over a few months, okay? And I'm not sure exactly how he ran the money, obviously, but I, I guarantee you he's not rushing out and selling five billion in one time. He couldn't do it. If he tried to do it, he would he could he could possibly start pushing the market around on his own, and it could be a self fulfilling prophecy. So there, you got to those guys, those big boys, have to get out kind of very carefully. So. Yeah, I hear you, and it's a great point. You know, how do you know? Everybody didn't already sell? Maybe they did. I don't know, but I doubt it seriously. And then th if you think about it, that's probably why you get these retrace rallies in here because you get the short covering and you get uh, the bottom fishers come in and think it's cheap. And then what happens? When that retrace rally comes up, the people who are running that battleship, okay, the people that, that, are selling, that have that $5 billion and haven't gone to cash yet, they're like, you know what, this is a gift horse, this little rally here. Let's use that as an opportunity to sell. And that's why the market starts going back down. Doesn't always work like that, but that's kind of the, the idea.
this was the best crowd ever. I don't know. I, I, I seriously mean that. I've never had so many great questions. It's awesome. So thank you, guys. Unfortunately, we're running out of time here. Uh, don't all bottoming charts have a lot of overhead supply? No, not necessarily. Uh, and sometimes that overhead supply could be a long ways away. Let me just draw that real quick, and we could probably have to wrap things up because uh, we're running out of time. Um, if the overhead supply is a long ways away, you know, and you get some kind of sell uh, buy signal, then that's okay. If the overhead supply is way above the market, I mean, this is all the stuff I covered, obviously the stock selection webinar, then it's okay. Let's say it's a hundred percent run up to there. It's just when it's like right on top of your position like this, where you have to be really careful. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's kind of the gist of it. If you get that, you get the idea. You're always great, Dave. Thank you for your time as always. You're welcome, Don. Even though I like to pick on Don, he's he's so nice. Pronounce Giro. Giro, I got it. Giro. All right, we'll have the this controversy. Uh, we'll we'll settle this controversy next week. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, for being here. Uh, I'm honored by your presence. I'm excited. This is the first time we had this many unanswered questions. So shoot me an email if there's anything you want me to follow up on. If not, I'll be happy to uh, cover it again. Uh, or cover it next week. Everybody have a great holiday if we don't talk again, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls uh, next week. Uh, I'm honored that you guys would be here and take the time out of, your, out of your busy schedule. So thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. So uh, hopefully see all you guys next week. Thanks again.